episode 004. Well, most of the deals that I have closed over my career have been at least $100 million, and then some of them over $500 million. Welcome to the GovCon Giants podcast, federal contracting for people on the outside looking in. If you are here to learn how to win a piece of the pie without getting your face smashed in, then you've tuned in to the right place. Now, the giant that not only walks the walk, but talks the talk, your host, Eric Coffey. Today's guest, Jennifer Namvar, when they say you want to learn from the best in order to be the best, Jennifer Namvar is the best at what she does. As the capture director for Lidos, she brings to the table more than 16 years of experience in all phases of the federal government business development life cycle. She's built her reputation in the GovCon industry by bidding and winning large strategic opportunities within the defense and federal civilian agencies. And she's done it her way by focusing on emerging and next generation technologies and solutions. She's worked for some of the top DOD 100 list companies, which include holding capture positions at CSRA, Agility, and NCI, some of the leading federal government contractors in the world, closing more than $1 billion, that's right, $1 billion with a B, and new and recompete business. She holds her federal CIO certification, an MS in technology management from George Mason, I'm so excited to have our guest today, Jennifer Nambar, who's going to talk to us about what it is to be a capture management and also how small businesses can start working with some of these large DOD firms out there today. So welcome, 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 Jennifer Nambar. My name is Jennifer Nambar, and I'm a capture director for Lidos. I've been in capture management for the last decade, but I've been in business development for federal government for the last 15 plus years, and I'm really dating myself here. So basically, I got started right out of right out of college. Actually, I went to Japan for three years, which is kind of an unusual step. Um, I'm actually half Japanese. Oh, really? So yeah. Wait. So where'd you go to college? I went to college at University of Maryland in College Park. I'm originally from Maryland, and my parents basically said to me. We're not paying for out of state, so you can apply to go to Maryland. (laughs) Well, I hope I get in. And I was a journalism (laughs) major, so I was happy because Maryland was one of the best journalism schools at that time. I I think they're still up there. But I knew that I wanted to do journalism, and I knew that I wanted to go to Japan on this program called the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. Right. So so I went to Japan because I wanted to meet my family for the first time over there, and I was living in northern northern. Japan and Hokkaido. And I came back three years later, I'm 24 years old. And I kind of made the decision that I didn't want to get into journalism because at that time it was very, very difficult to get a job in journalism. And candidly, the pay wasn't great. So I was like, why would I want to struggle for all these years, try to make it in a very competitive field and, and maybe not even be doing the kind of dream journalism job that I would like. So I didn't really know what to do with my life and sort of fell into federal government contracting by virtue of the fact that I came back home to the DC metro area. It's Maryland. Right. And that's the bulk of the jobs. I don't know if you're aware of this, but 40% of the GDP in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area is in government contracting. So that's a huge number huge number of I believe that because actually so in my book I quoted an article that once said at some point some of the richest zip codes in the country were in the Maryland DC area the wealthiest yeah. zip codes so yeah all and come from government contracting dollars yes so that definitely boosts our our economy and I I ended up going to Virginia because northern Virginia in the Arlington area because that was closer to where a lot of the jobs were. And so I've been in Virginia ever since then. How far, how far is Maryland from Virginia, from that area? It's all really close. So from Uh, 30 minute drive. It depends on what part of of Virginia you're living in or Maryland, but you know, within an hour, most people are all within an hour of the DC area. Okay. Some people live further out. The commute's not great over here. As you may have heard, it's one of the worst commutes in the country. So you try to live as close in as possible. Mm. But it's, you know, obviously it's more expensive the closer to the city you live. Right, 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 right. Well, yeah, because a lot of times I know um, when I work with the Navy, they come out of Norfolk. Yeah, 
that's a little further. That's that's a couple of hours away. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So you're back in. So you came back home. Um, you you learn about government contracting. You're in the Maryland area. You moved to Virginia. Yes. What next? So I was working for a small business, and I basically started as a business development associate kind of technical writer person. So I was doing everything from helping to write the proposals to helping them put together their marketing materials and going to trade shows to going with more senior level folks to customer visits. And the the firm that I work for specialized mostly in IT, but we also did some systems engineering types of work for for example, the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. So there, there was a variety of things, but what I really gravitated toward was the proposals because that's basically the lifeblood blood of the company and the way in which government contractors are able to get their business. But also, Jennifer, you're a journalism major, so you like writing anyways. I, yes. <laughs> I mean, right. you know, I mean, that's, come on. That's, that's, you know, you like writing, so that was easy for you. <laughs> Right. And so eventually I got into proposal management and that I loved the intensity of it. Uh, So when you get a federal request for proposal, it's usually about a 30 to 60 day period that you have to respond. And the requirements are very specific in terms of what they want. They ask you specific questions. They tell you what they're going to evaluate. They tell you everything down to the number of pages you have to the font size, exactly what they want. And so eventually I got into managing the proposal process, which I really enjoyed. Interesting. Well. So now when you say managing the proposal process, does that mean you have a team? Yes, I had a team, I have a budget. Uh, so basically the team would consist of, you'd have, so usually the government will ask for a technical volume. Yep where you describe your technical understanding and approach of the statement of work and a management volume, which will ask you typically what, who, you know, how you will manage the pro the program, what processes and methodologies you will use, who you were teamed with, what does your organization structure look like? What does your staffing look like? Things like that. So you'd have a management lead and then they typically ask for past performance. So you have someone leading the past performance and then there's writers as well who will help because you have the leaders and the writers. And then there's desktop publishing that goes into it. Graphic support. There is editors. Um, There are editors, I should say. There are red red team, pink team reviews as the reviews of the proposal at different milestones. So it's a pretty intense process with a, with a big team. Now, let me ask you this. Were you, you weren't still at the small company at that point. Yes. I started doing that at the small company, but then I actually moved to a even smaller company. I went to a startup for a little while. Yeah. Yeah, I was one of the original employees at, at the startup, and I really enjoyed that experience. They're actually doing great now, and I stayed there, and I helped them, you know, start bidding on a ton of different proposals, and they actually, we made a lot of progress. It just, it was very intense that year, and I wanted to actually start getting into capture management, which is similar to proposal management, but it's a different discipline. They're they're kind of re- brother and sister in the same <laughs> spectrum. Now let me, let's let's let me pause here. Um, I have a definition for capture management. You tell me if this is accurate. It says a capture manager responsible for winning a business opportunity. The capture management manager will be probably uh, not be the initial salesperson, but will get involved as a dedicated resource once a company decides to pursue a lead. Capture managers are business development oriented, dedicate their time starting in the pre RFP stages and continuing through award. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, yeah I think that's that's pretty accurate. Okay. Sometimes capture manager can't capture managers are the dedicated salesperson. Okay. But generally I think your definition is correct. Okay. Okay. All right. So now now again, a small company doesn't need a proposal management process, do they? I think that they should have a proposal management process. Okay. Okay. So they need a process, but do but you are a proposal manager. So, you know, yes. if you got a startup with five people, um, how would you, how would you suggest they structure that? 
for a startup business. Yeah, if you have a startup and there's five of you guys, like I know when you started, you were doing the proposals mm-hmm. yourself. But uh, how would you recommend, like, for a startup company that has, say, five employees? Right. So I would recommend just you're just talking about the proposal process. Just the proposal right? process, correct? Yes. So what I would recommend is that you put together for each proposal a schedule and an outline of the requirements and the evaluation criteria. You you dedicate or assign a team of people and give each person on your five person team a responsibility for putting together a part of the proposal. And I would suggest that you uh, hold reviews so that, and, and get a couple of people, either if it's a startup, sometimes you have a board, sometimes you have business advisors, get those people to review your proposal. Don't review your own proposal. Mm, interesting. I never thought about that. Oh, you could, but you could probably now, um, do you think that's something that they could, if, if you didn't have someone to do it, do you think that's someone thing that we could outsource? Like maybe through, you know, like now they're outsourcing stuff. I know I use Guru and Fiverr um, and Upwork. You think we could outsource maybe the review part of the process? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I wouldn't call it outsourcing. I would break in con- trusted consultants. I, I'm not familiar with those companies you just listed, but there's several proposal and capture consulting companies that have very senior folks that you can hire to review your proposal, absolutely. Interesting. Okay, do you have um, you know of any that you can that you work with or you're, you're familiar with? There are so many of them out there. I can okay. absolutely send you a list. Of- All right. So, well, yeah, if you do that, that'd be great. No, the companies that I mentioned, what they are, they are uh, companies that have like what do you call them? So I use them for different services, like designing my website, building me software. They're where you where you have people that work from home. And so they basically, uh, they give you a proposal to do certain services and, and functions sure. for you. Um, so they're like, I want their, um, what do they call? There's a name for them. I can't think of it right now. Not template. Free. They're, yeah. They're like freelancers. Right. I would get a freelancer that is specific to this industry and specific to propo- federal proposals. Okay. Okay. So we, so in sense, yeah. So as long as we found someone that knew the industry and did federal proposals. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. So we have a schedule, we have an outline, we assign a team, and then we hold reviews. Right. But generally, we also do calls daily. And those are accountability calls. And also, they're usually about 15 to 20 minutes long. We call them the stand up, the daily stand up. And we go around, ask every person what their status is and, and ensure that they don't have any questions. And if they do, we resolve them right away or after every, everyone else gets off the line if it's a longer issue. Wow. And that's for accountability. And then, you know, you review the draft of the proposal to make sure it's in the right direction. You 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 will review a more mature draft of the proposal, and then you'll do, you know, the final review of what's about to go to the government. And you typically want to give yourself a, the last week before the proposal is due just to get make sure everything looks perfect, um, get get it all formatted correctly, and all that sort of stuff because, and, and produce a proposal if it's a hard copy response. Or even with electronic copies, you wanna give yourself extra time to submit just in case something goes wrong with the system where you have to upload it. For example, if it's not email or if you email it and they're getting too much traffic on their server, you definitely wanna give yourself build in enough time into the schedule so that you don't have a fail and miss a deadline. Because if you do miss a deadline, even by a minute, the government typically will throw you out and you don't want to waste all that time and money for, for having a late submission. Right. Right. Wow. Yep. Wow. No, that was, that was great. So now going back, um, you said you moved into capture management and we talked yeah. about a little about the definition. So tell us, that was uh, where were you working at at the time when you jumped into that role? I was working at NCI. Okay. Okay. Which was a, it's a large large business. It's not as large as some of the companies I've been with since then, but it's a large business. And basically, I started. I wanted to transition from proposal to capture, so I started making my role into more and more of a hybrid role. And capture starts earlier than the proposal manager. So what I did was instead of and getting engaged right when the RFP came out or a week week or so 
before the RFP came out, I started getting engaged much, much earlier. That way I could observe what the capture manager was doing and jump in and help him do his his work because capture manager wears many hats. Like you said, the first part of your definition, the capture manager is responsible for winning. Right. So the buck stops with, with you when you're capture. So I was trying to make myself as indispensable as possible as I could to that capture manager. Then I started putting myself through school to get my master's degree to kind of further bolster my case that, Hey, I'm, I'm the real deal and I'm ready to move into capture. And so I eventually got the title um, continued working at NCI for a while and then moved over to CSE, which was an even larger company, more well-known in the industry. Since then, they've gone through some mergers and acquisitions. It's now the, the company I worked for, CSE, is now, um, wow, okay, so it split into two different companies. It merged with another company uh-huh. and then they got purchased by GD. So it's now called GD. <laughs> but listen, what, isn't NCI a top DOD company as well? It, it is, but but not. it wasn't quite at the same level in terms of um, revenues as CSE was at the time. Right, so. right, right, right. Okay, but just just for the context for everyone that's listening out here, uh, NCI is on the top <laughs> Department of Defense hundred contractors list. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just, I mean, for us, anyone on that list is ginormous. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was a billion dollar company, I think, at the time. Right. Okay. Okay. And and CSC, I can't remember how many billions they were at the time, but they were several times larger than NCI. Right. Now, let me ask you this. At NCI, did they have multiple capture managers? Oh, yes. Okay. How did they How did they break it down? Was it by division? Was it by region? Was it? As, I want, I'm trying to remember. I believe at NCI, so each company has a different philosophy on doing this, right? Okay. And it, a lot of times it depends on the size of the company and how much they're willing to invest in capture resources. By the way, the, the more they invest... I, I think the more successful they are. Okay. Obviously, a lot of companies try to try to do it and and save money and be very um, you know tight tight with the budgets. Right. And I mean, of course, it's good to be a good steward of company resources, but it's not. It's something that the more you invest in into doing high quality capture, the better your returns are going to be. Obviously, in the right. business. Right. So uh, your original question was NCI. How were they? How were they organized? I believe that they were, or we were organized there by division, I want to say. So we had a DOD group and there were capture managers assigned to that DOD group. And then there was a civil group and there were capture managers that were more assigned to the civil group. I want to say that's how they did it at NCI at that time. Now, other companies I've been with have, they've gone back and forth too. So right, right. I've been at companies where they had a centralized capture team with really high end capture managers that were assigned to very strategic deals and it didn't matter which business line is because honestly, Eric, at the end of the day, if you understand how to do capture management, it doesn't matter if you're going after a DOD contract, if you're going after a health contract or going after, you know, a civilian agency that's it's the process is the process. The difference, the key difference is the domain expertise. So, if you want someone to be more customer facing, to have the embedded relationships with that customer in, in addition to doing capture, then, and that's always helpful, then you can assign them and give them kind of a specialty swim lane. Mm. Okay. Okay. So let's walk us through the typical day of a capture manager. What are, what are you, what are their activities? What are they doing? What are they looking at? It really depends on what stage you are in okay. of the capture because the typical day will will vary. But there's certain key areas that capture managers will always focus on. Okay. Um, one of the key areas is customer engagement. So the more customer intimacy that you have, the higher your win probability will be on the on your opportunity that you're working. So developing a call plan. Who are you going to call on in the government? What is their role? What is the message that you're going to be delivering? Who are you going to be taking with you? Scheduling the meeting, you know, that kind of thing. That's one big chunk of our day. 
uh, planning for the meeting. What are you going to say when you get there? What questions do you want to ask? So that takes up some time. Another thing that capture managers always focus on is teaming. So for a particular opportunity, usually one company doesn't do the whole thing themselves. They bring a team of, of other companies. So you spend a lot of time, okay, what are the requirements this customer is looking for? Which ones does my company do best? Are there small business requirements? Which small businesses would be good a good fit for this contract? Reaching out to the small business. Hey, I like that one. Yeah, reaching out to the small businesses and, and um, finding out what their capabilities are, how they can enhance your, your win probability, you know, setting up the uh, non-disclosure agreements, the teaming agreements, getting them involved in the solution. So that's one. Another big thing is solution. So how do you bring a differentiated solution? Most of the work that I focus on is not um, what they call lowest price technically acceptable. Okay. Work is best value. So where the, where the customer is looking for, you know, the best technical slash management slash past performance slash price solution that they can, they can uh, buy with their, with the money that they have. Right. So solution is a big deal. How do you put together a differentiated solution? That's not um, something that your competitors are going to put together. You know, how is your solution uniquely meeting the customer's hot buttons that you should know based on, visiting with the customer and executing your call plan. Um, so that's another piece of it. Wow. Exciting stuff. Now you mentioned the small business piece, which is, again, that's, uh, that's our area. And sure. um, now when you, uh, I would imagine, and this is my assumption, as you move up the food chain, so to speak, and, and to large organizations, you probably deal less and less with small businesses. Is that a fair assumption or no? No, that's, we, we work with small businesses. So basically, a lot of the RFPs that come out will have a small business requirement as part of them. And since teaming is under my purview as a capture manager, I have to, to put together a winning team. And if, the, if that includes 40% of my subcontracted dollars go to small business, I have to figure out which small businesses that I need to bring on my team. So... I will, so how do we identify who those are? Right, right. Well, the first thing we do is we look at the small businesses that we've successfully partnered with in the past. And we say, okay, well, I know this company does this service really, really well. And so that that's one way. Or if we're looking for a specific socioeconomic categories, for example, a lot of times they'll say we want you know, of your small business plan, we have 5% woman owned small business, 3% service disabled, veteran owned small business, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll, we'll find the small business partners that meet those specific socioeconomic and then look at how their company meets the areas of the statement of work. So that's another way. Uh, and we have, most large companies have a small business liaison or small business office so they keep a database or some records about small businesses so we can ask them if we if we don't know of any in terms of word about and then the third way that we look is through customer relationships so a lot of customers have their very favorite small businesses and sometimes these are one or two person companies that have worked with the customer for yes. 20 years or something like that those are our favorites to bring on because if the small business can bring a relationship or bring some goodwill with the customer, that is a, a extra bonus. Right. That's golden. Yeah. 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 Okay. No. And you know what? I've seen that myself in my own personal experience. Um, as a contractor, I've gone to facilities and bases and, um, they said, well, we, you know, we like this, we like these electricians or we like this concrete company. And I get mine's in mm-hmm. construction. So, you know, we're building a building and they say, well, um, we'd like it. You know, these, these, this is our favorites, right? Because they, they have a presence in the area. They've been there for 30 years. Like you said, they've had a relationship with the customer. Um, mm-hmm. and truthfully, in my own experiences, I don't know about, you know, yourself. Um, I don't know if you get to see the project come to fruition and how far along that you get to do. But as a small business, I was engaged the whole way through. Um, we found that that's worked out better because since they had a relationship with the project managers already, 
they could talk to them. <laughs> right. The small, you know, the small business guy could talk to the project manager and get things resolved. Whereas, you know, it wasn't by force where we would normally have to come in and be more of like an adversary times if things didn't go our way the small business guy's like no no i know jeff let me call jeff and get him out here and he'll he'll we could get this thing resolved so that's been my yes. experiences um when they had the relationship in place do you have a do you get to see the project come to fruition and completion or anything like that or are you just focus on the uh up to the proposal part i just focus primarily I focus on up until the proposal goes into the government, okay. but I still remain engaged because usually it doesn't end there. Uh, usually the government comes back with questions or clarification questions, or they come back. Um, and, um, sometimes there's a protest. Okay. So if there's a protest, then you have to get engaged with that and try to, you know, from engage with the legal, the legal um, counsel within the company to figure out how to deal with that and what's your strategy there. So there's a lot, I still do remain engaged after the proposal goes in, but in terms of the, of the contract execution, I do not get involved right, in that part. Right, 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 right. No, which makes sense. Yeah. I would know that again, it, I don't think even um, as you know, now I've transitioned you know, as you start working with large organizations, it's a, it would be impossible to maintain the relationships and worry about the contract being executed. So I can understand that. Um, now let's go back. We we're talking about the small business. So you said that there was three ways, someone in the past, um, someone that you guys had in your uh, list, and then uh, someone who had previous relationships with the client. Now mm -hmm. I know, and again, I'm you know speaking on behalf of the thousands of small businesses out there. I know a lot of times they say, well, Eric, you know, when I, when I re reach out to one of these large organizations like a GD, uh, for example, um, they say they'll put me on a list and then nothing happens. Is there right. something that they should be doing differently? How can they distinguish themselves? This is the advice I always give to small businesses. I think that this is a relationship based business. And the best thing you can do is number one, nurture a relationship with a decision maker in the in one of these large businesses and kind of attach yourself at, to, at the hip and to that person and just constantly not constantly but you know every couple of weeks be you know have lunch with them reach out to them right um nurture a relationship with them so that way you are at the top of their mind when it is when a contract is coming out and they need to fulfill a requirement they'll they'll remember you and that's typically not someone i mean it could be someone from the contract side you might want to work that angle but you might want to consider also working the angle of someone who is dealing with a large volume of proposals that they have to deal with whether it's a business development person or a capture manager who's working uh. a few different deals so you might want to do that instead of going wide and trying to hit you know gd and all these other companies why don't you just pick a few that you think you could be successful with too, depending on your size and, and nurture a couple of relationships within, within there. And then the other suggestion I would say is bring your client relationships to the primes. So if you can nurture some customer relationships in the same way that of customers you ideally would want to work with, and you can say, hey, I can make an introduction introduction to, you know, customer so-and-so. And I hear that this opportunity is coming out. You would be a great prime, be a great fit for a prime, and we would love to partner with you on it. That's kind of a slam dunk way to do it, in my opinion. That's how I would do it if I were small. Business. Oh, I love that, Jennifer. I really do. I'm, I'm, I, my wheels are already turning in my head and some things I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've been to the Navy and uh, one of the clients that I represent does about 20 million. And mm -hmm. they said it, that their projects start at 20 million. And so that we need to bring a large prime to the table. Um, but I like that idea as uh, we have the relationship with the client and they're, they're happy to work with us. But unfortunately, they just didn't have any projects um, that were of that size or magnitude that we could handle. So um, I love that. And I can imagine that uh, the majority of 
the people that, you know, I work with, they're in the same situation. Um, what I've found recently, and I don't know if, if you've had the same experiences, I've noticed that even though they're setting aside a, a large portion of the small business dollars, the contracts are getting larger. And so it's making it more difficult for the small companies to, to, to jump in and get started. Mm-hmm. And that's what I've seen. Just, you know, reading, uh, reports from the 809 panel and looking at data from some of the other GAO reports. That's kind of like the analysis. That's what I kind of saw from the data, what it suggested. Um, so they definitely need a way to, to, to kind of get into, um, and engage into the process. But I like that. So they should definitely bring someone to the table. I think that to me, um, makes the most sense. Now you're saying nurture relationship with the business developer or the capture manager, but how would someone find that person? Well, you don't need to find that many people, but one way you can find it is through word of mouth and you can also find it through networking events or you can find it through LinkedIn. I mean, you can do searches on LinkedIn for company, filter it by company, by role, and then you can see the list of people that are in, you know, business development role at a certain company and you can start looking at their profiles and see which ones are working with customers that you would want to work with. And then when you approach them, so here's a mistake I see a lot of small businesses do. A lot of small businesses, I can't tell you how many, will reach out to me on a daily basis and they'll say, hey, we're doing business with you guys with an X, Y, and Z agency. Would you like to have lunch with me? And um, so we can talk about where we can we can work together. Right. And to me, that is they're not giving me enough information right. to like, why would I want to have lunch with them? It's not that I don't want to have lunch with them. Don't get me wrong. Right. I like meeting people. It's just, I don't have enough time to meet with every single person that reaches out to me and says they want to do business with me because they're a small business. Right. And I know a lot of small businesses. So if they reached out to, to me with what we were talking about earlier and said, Hey, I am, I'm a small business. I'm a, service to disabled veteran owned small business. Right. And I heard about this great opportunity with the Navy from customer so-and-so. Yep. We're, and we're really seeking out a large prime to partner with on it. And we think that your company would be the ideal fit. Are you guys looking at this opportunity? And if so, can I come can we set up a 15 minute call to discuss um, who I could um, discuss our capabilities and set up a longer longer meeting after that. Right. So I think that is the best approach because 15 minutes, most people can spare. You've already articulated what your value is. You're bringing a customer and, and you've identified an opportunity which they may or may not already be aware of. Mm. No, I, I like it. I like it. I think, I think, and you know, part of the idea behind this is giving people um, who are listening, actionable steps and practical steps. Um, and I think that was very, um, like spot on for activities that people can leave from here, listening to us have this conversation today and take it back and implement right away. Um, any, what other type of mistakes do you, you hear or you see small businesses make? Anything else that you could think of? With small businesses, I think that small businesses get very, very tactical and reactive when it comes to business development in general. I think that most small businesses use the excuse that, hey, we're a small business, so we can't have a process, so we can't have a strategy. And instead of having a strategy of, okay, this year I want to go, these are the accounts that I want to focus on. These are the the customers I want to focus on. These are the opportunities at the beginning of the year and build a pipeline. And instead of doing that um, and then assigning resources to it, I see them more kind of waiting for the, um, you know, the chasing the next shiny object right. or waiting for the next opportunity right. and completely overextending themselves and not actually engaging with customers or engaging with those partners that they could um, work with the, the other large businesses or even small businesses. If you want. Um, I think you said earlier, you said they go wide instead of deep. Yeah. Right. And that that's what I see is the biggest mistake for small businesses and growth. Interesting. No, I, and I, and you know, um, someone has said something similar uh, in the market, which is like when you said chase the shiny object. I actually wrote an article on, on the shiny object syndrome, which 
<laughs> so it, it touched home. But, you know, because it's something that a lot of entrepreneurs have, right? So the same mm-hmm. traits that make you entrepreneurial um, also, you know, they can work against you in some ways where you're off just chasing the next shiny object. Uh, and it's interesting because I've seen where, in particular, like 8A firms, they, you know, if someone needs an 8A, they go after, if it's like, say, a metal building, and then it might be a security job, and then it might be to sell some furniture, but they never really, <laughs> but they never really focus on building a business. And so at the end of the day, uh, when, you know, when the 8A program is over with, they're left and they don't have a business and they don't have relationships and they don't have customers because they didn't, they didn't go deep, right? They went wide. Um, so I think that's great. I like that. And and it's funny that you said that also about they, they make the excuse not to actually put together uh, a process. And that's why I asked you that because I've actually never heard of this, like a formal process, the way that you described it before. So I think this, that I, I've never heard of that before. I mean, we have a process in terms of, like you said, assigning persons to work on the proposal, but you seem to have um, something much more uh, structured and organized is now the guy that you the person that you interviewed Eric what's his name Eric Gregory Eric yeah. Gregory okay I noticed that um, you referenced him he was part of APMP the Association for Proposal Management Professionals right um, is that something that you recommend that small businesses that are getting into writing proposals for the DOD is it something they should have uh, maybe someone from their office uh, become certified or go through this process how do you feel about that I think APMP is a wonderful organization. I, in terms of the certification, I think that's a, a great step. But um, joining joining the organization, I don't think costs that much money as an individual. It's a good networking opportunity. They have a conference every year, and they you can learn about all of the proposal best practices and some of those processes. Now, uh, the person we we're talking about, Eric Gregory, he was a CEO of APMP a couple of different times. And he's also part of an organization called Shipley Associates, which is a pretty well known. They sort of created the industry standard in our industry in terms of putting together a process and methodology for proposal management, capture management, and the whole BD life cycle. So they offer training courses as well that individuals can take or companies can take. So that's always a good option, too, in terms of learning what the process is. Interesting. Okay, so we'll make sure that. We definitely um, have some of the links to those websites and information in the show notes for this, uh, just in case anyone's interested in pursuing that. No, when I when I read the article, and you may want to just touch on the article briefly, uh, what it was about, and it looks like you did an interview with him and you wrote that on LinkedIn. You want to share yeah. some of the takeaways so from the article? I write, so what, um, one of my hobbies is to write a blog and a vlog and, and film a vlog every week on LinkedIn. I don't have my own website yet or anything like that, but I wanted to do that because A, I thought that there's a lot of people in in my profession, in my industry that are interested in capture management topics, you know, tips and tricks, capture life, professional development, those kinds of topics. And I like to write, like you said, I'm a, I'm a journalism major and, and I enjoy doing that. So that's kind of my hobby. And So in doing that, I don't always like to make it all about myself. I was, I was really interested in how capture management has evolved over time because it's a fairly new profession and it it is a niche profession. And if you go outside of the DC area, generally people have no idea what a capture manager even is. Mm -hmm. So a friend of mine who is- Wait, time out. In fairness, Jennifer, I didn't know what it was until I met you. Surprise me at all. That's very normal. So, in fairness, uh, though, I don't want to be, uh, you know, like I'm the, the A student here, okay? Uh, you know, I, I had to look it up and research it when I saw that. And I was like, what is a capture manager? And again, I've been doing GovCon for 12 years now, right? And I've never heard the capture manager. But again, um, we've never worked with any of those large DOD contractors either. So, um, right. So a friend of mine who is actually an APMP made the introduction to Eric for on my behalf because I wanted to, I know that he's an industry veteran. He's actually been in the industry for over 40 years. So that was kind of the impetus of my interview. I wanted to know how the profession had, had evolved over the last um, 
several decades and he gave me a great overview of that and obviously he's impacted a lot of people's lives because a lot of people commented on the article and said hey he was one of my mentors he taught me everything i knew he was a legend in in this industry and on and on and on so clearly that definitely struck a chord with many of the readers so it's happy right right no no it was um it, it, like i said i uh, i'm learning from reading your article there's a lot of things that i didn't know about uh, as well right and you know you got i mean truthfully i don't know if uh very many of us small business are going to ever get to that level um a lot of times most people you know they want like a, a comfort business right so they get to five or ten million or twenty million whatever it is their level of comfort and they kind of stay there and and trust me, I understand that because running a business and dealing with employees and human resources is not fun. Um, right. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I know I had 23 employees. It, it's not fun. And I know people with 90 employees and have had 300 and, you know, they burn out and it's difficult and it's, it's hard uh, building a business beyond a certain level. So I don't think we'll all get to that point. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think learning from some of the big guys and what they do and how they attack it, I think, can help some of us become more polished, right? And uh, improve our process or even establish a process if we don't have one. I think that would definitely help us. Uh, now, one of the things that you mentioned is you helped, um, and I don't remember where I saw this, but I know you said you contributed to like a billion dollars in sales. Yes. So tell us about it. Tell us how, how does that come about is that uh, so when you, you capture your, your projects and then you kind of follow them and you say, okay, I closed, I don't know, $20 million, $50 million. Is that kind of how you derive that number? Well, most of the deals that I have closed over my career have been at least a hundred million dollars. And then some of them over $500 million. Wow. Yeah. So usually I, I work on some of the larger dollar value deals. So that's kind of how I, come to the number is just wow. kind of add them all up. And I'm not talking about just the IDIQs either. There's a task order. Right. You're talking about the actual, yeah, the task yeah. order. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and it, and I'm glad you made that point of distinction because a lot of people will say, I want a $7 million contract and it's really an IDIQ and the value, like I interviewed a lady who won a $500 million IDIQ, but she admitted that she only, they only ordered 50 million worth of task orders on the 500. Yeah. So they yeah. never... They never got to any even close to the five hundred million uh, of the IDIQ. So, right. wow. Um, well, I mean, if you keep at it for long enough, it you it starts to add up. And there are people that could blow that number away. Trust me. But, but I mean, it's it's significant, and I'm continuing to 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 uh, work on you know more closing larger and larger deals. So let me ask you this. Um, you told us all the good stuff. Is there uh, a time where there was uh, a situation where that you couldn't figure out a solution um, that it was difficult where there was, you know, I, I want to hear more of a, 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 a down story, right? Where you were like, I don't know what to do. Who do I turn to? And then it kind of worked itself out. Right. Let me think about that for a second. So yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly challenges when it comes to capture and um, a lot of those revolve around the team because it is a team sport, right? You're the leader as a capture manager, but it is a team sport and there's a lot of money on the line. Like yes. we just talked about. Yes. So, you know, one of the things is being very clear on the roles and responsibilities that, you know, if you're the capture manager, you need to, um, be the leader and you have to use different leadership skills. Sometimes you can be collaborative and sometimes you have to be directive. Mm. So um, that's one thing. Another thing is that you kind of have to stand up for yourself. There's a lot of um, opinions on how you should, how you should do things and you need to take those opinions, but you also need to take a stand and be decisive in terms of what, um, how you want to go forward with something and be able to, to back that up. And, you know, sometimes people want to raise the price or maybe they want to reduce the price, but you have a strong feeling about that that's backed up by something. And you th say, Hey, if you raise this price, we'll lose, you know, you have to be very firm with people and 
Um, so that's, that's very important. Um, another dark side of it is sometimes you get very, very busy and you'll be spending evenings and weekends with, you know, working, really? not with your family, not with friends. I mean, you, there's some long, long weeks, especially when, uh, when there's a proposal that's imminently due. So that's why I was saying earlier, you said, what's a typical day look like when the proposal is out or is about to be out, those days get much, much longer when, we usually start working on on captures, you know, not nine months in advance, six months in advance. So when, or a year in advance, depending on the size. So when you're twelve, nine, or six months out, you can control your schedule a lot more than when you're a month away from the proposal, or, or worse yet, when you're in it. So, oh yeah, oh, I can imagine. I know when you're in it, you're in it. I've been, I've been, I've had those long nights. Yep. I've had those sleepless nights. You stay up the whole night till the next day to put everything together. Um, yeah. So interesting. That no, that's that's uh, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, you so one of the things that you mentioned also in the article, since you said pricing, um, mm-hmm. which I thought was I had never um, seen it framed in that way. You mentioned um, three different scenarios with like an eighty percent probability where they can execute fifty percent and twenty percent. Well, that was Eric's price to win <laughs> methodology. That oh, that was how Eric framed it. Yes, yes. So, well, just do you got do you have a strategy, or you, if you want to share, or if, I mean, we can even talk about Eric's strategy. I mean, I, let's let's talk about I, let's talk about in generally how it's done today. Because remember, that article is about the history and how they used to do it um, back then. I think it's today we do it a little bit differently than how he was describing how they used to do it back in the eighties and nineties. I mean, it's similar, but it's a more structured. So what, what we typically do is we look at our, our competition first. Right. So who, do, who is likely going after this? And what do we know about their, their patterns of how they bid things? Do they tend to bid high? Do they tend to bid low? And we know this because hopefully you're doing a little bit of research on your competition and award data and from, you know, some of the customers that you're looking at and some of that stuff is out there or if they protested or what have you, some of that stuff is out there. So do whatever kind of re- market research you can on your, on your competitors and you model a scenario. So um, you basically have to look at what the requirements are and take a look at how, you know, what you think your competitors might bid on it. And then you have to also do kind of a, a bottoms up analysis on, you know, if there's, in your in your case, you're in more in in the construction field, correct? So I'm sure that prices can vary depending on what materials you use yes. and how you build something. Yes. So you have to kind of model different scenarios of, you know, bronze, silver, gold, for example, of how how they might put together a different mousetrap than yours. And then take a look at what you know of what the customer is looking for. If they have some hot buttons around, hey, it has to be this beyond what's written in the requirements. And then based on that, you and you have to understand your customer. Are they price sensitive, highly price sensitive, or are they more interested in quality? So you can put, you know, you can put a higher price tag on it. Right, right. So, so those are really the factors that go into it. It's really around your competition, your customer, and kind of historical trends. Interesting. You know, we've seen that where we're looking at, and, and I mean, I find this really often, which you mentioned. There, You know, you read the write-up, and it's clear <laughs> that they've left some things out. And so, you know, you have to make a, a judgment call. Do you put that in your price now? Or do you leave it out? No, you don't put it in your price now. At least in our industry, if there if it isn't written as a requirement, then you cannot price it. You can't price it because you'll price yourself out of the job. Exactly. Okay, and that, and that makes sense. Um, that makes sense. But if you have an opportunity to ask during Q and A if something that hey, in order to build, you know, in order to build this, you need to ha- have this requirement in it, or it won't work. Ask the question. You know. Right, 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 right. Good. Um, I know we're running up on the, the our time frame here. Um, 
let me ask you something. Is there any uh, resources that you can say help contribute to your success? Maybe a book um, or tools that you used that helped you uh, improve, learn. Like you said, you mentioned how you have to be a leader, um, assertiveness. You know, where did that come from? Is there something that you know you read and you said, okay, you know, it it gave you what you needed inside? Because I, you know, what I found truthfully is a lot of people are afraid. Um, Mm-hmm. And uh, they're afraid to take the next step. They're afraid to, you know, maybe reach out to someone like you. They may have the best technology and the best team, but then they're afraid to even to approach someone like yourself and let you know that this exists out there. So what, you know, what are some of the, the, the ways that you've overcome fear? Uh, what are some of the tools that you've used or anything maybe that you'd like to share that you've read um, to help you overcome some of your fear of going to say the next stage or the next level? Yeah. Well, I believe that that everyone has got the ability to create art or produce something that is of use to the world, you know, serve in some kind of way. And if you're afraid to put it out there because you fear judgment that, oh, people aren't going to like what I what I wrote or they're not going to like the company that I put together or they they're going to think that I'm an egotistical maniac because I started my own company or I started my own podcast. Um if you're afraid of that and you don't put your art out into the world, then no one gets the benefit of it. And that doesn't do anyone any good, right? There And there will be people who don't like what what you put out in the world. They, they'll disagree with it. They'll be jealous because, you know, you're more successful than the next person. But, and there's always going to be, you can't please everyone all the time but there are going to be some people out there who really like what you put out there who really like your company i mean who who have jobs because you created a company right and none of that value would exist if you if you were too scared to put it out there and i learned a lot of that from a book i read by seth godin actually i've read several of his books but one of my favorites was his recent one called this is marketing and he he's a great writer. Yes, yes, he is. <laughs> and, uh, I have, I have, so I have a book right here behind me. Um, Small is the new big. Okay. So, <laughs> so I learned a lot of that philosophy from him, and that helped me um, get over some fears about putting my work out into the world or what have you. And then, in terms of for for capture management, a book that I really like is not about capture management, but it's about leadership. It's called. Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink. That's a great book. Heard of Jocko, um, but I, I've never read anything from him. Yeah, he's actually a great writer. And then, um, he has an audible version of the book, too, where he he reads it. So I, I would highly recommend looking at that. It's called Extreme Ownership? Ownership. Extreme Ownership, yep. It was about his lessons learned from being a Navy SEAL and how he applies that to leadership in business and in life. Before we um, close out, anything that you'd like to share uh, with small businesses um, that are coming up, that are new to the, the GovCon world, to new to the Department of Defense space, um, anything, lessons that you've learned over the last, I don't want to say how long you've been doing this for, but over your years of working in Gov contracting. <laughs> yeah, I would say definitely do some networking, do some of the things like you're doing, Eric, about having having a podcast, having YouTube, if you can get increased exposure, that definitely helps. But I, I would just, you know, repeat the advice I gave earlier, which is one, you know, have a strategy for which customers you want to work with, which types of work you actually want to do as a company. So have a vision for your company to um, network with strategic decision makers that can they can help you and provide some value to them that will incentivize them to help you by um, bringing them the customer relationships and following up and being a good partner. And I think uh, you'll be very successful if you, if you don't follow the shiny objects. <laughs> no, no, I agree. I agree. And uh, like I said before, if we can, when we finish up, um, maybe uh, we'll follow up with a, um, an email and you can send some of the links that we could put at the bottom referencing some of those uh, proposal organizations uh, that we talked about earlier in the conversation. Sure. No. 
So, uh, but listen, Jennifer, this was a great call. Uh, thank you so much. I know I only had you for a short time today, but uh, you have a lot of information. Um, and I think we'll definitely have to circle back around and do maybe a part two with you. If that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, it was great talking to you today. Thank you. You too. All right. Have Bye-bye. a great one. See you now. Hey, how was that episode today? Jennifer is the jujitsu master of Federal World. Outside the office, she's a wife, mom of two, and a fitness enthusiast. Make sure to check out her vlog on LinkedIn, Capture Life and Professional Development, linkedin.com forward slash Jennifer Namvar. That's N-A-M-V-A-R. We will have any book recommendations, show notes, and the link to her professional profile on the website, govconscience.com. Also, if you like what you hear, make sure to subscribe, leave a comment, give us a five-star ratings. We would appreciate any feedback that you have, whatever you learn from today's episode. The world is round and we are all on it together. My show is only a medium to facilitate a more serious conversation about the possibilities that lie within you. I know that some of the subscribers have already moved over from YouTube and hopefully on iTunes, they will give me a shout out, drop some comments in the bar below. As always, until next time, thanks for tuning in.